And I'm so happy to have Laura, Laura Benetsky Joseph on. She's a book author, podcaster, survivor, and advocate. She is a multi-generational intuitive and business owner of Healing with Spirit and a member of Track Coalition in Massachusetts. We're going to talk a lot about that because Massachusetts has a lot of problems. And tell us, you know, how did you become involved in all of this and being an author? So, I think my case started, so... <laughs> I was raised in a family that I think my father wanted a boy as the oldest. So I was raised very much independent. You can do anything and everything. And I felt like that was true up until um, I met my ex-husband, who we coined Clark Rockefeller wannabe. Uh -huh. And um, he's not from this country. And um, he came... He has a lot of, I think, I, I don't want to go into it because we know the retaliation of speaking foul of that. Mm -hmm. But um, I will just say that when I left, we're told like, if you deal with abuse, you get you you leave, you put protocols in place. And because I also grew up in a domestic violence household, I was hyper independent. Mm. And I was like, oh, crap, if we're going down this road, we're not doing this. And so I, you know, got into it, you know, started working with a shelter, got a restraining order, told him he had to leave because he did this in front of my children. The, mm. la the last episode of abuse where um, and he wasn't even living at the house at the time. He showed up at the house at 7 a.m and got into a physical altercation, grab me by the throat and slam me down on the, the um, tile floor in the kitchen. And he did that in front of my kids as they were getting ready for school. Aww. And so that sparked, because of that, the need to get a restraining order. Mm -hmm. He refused to leave. I had to barricade myself into the room. I called a friend, he grabbed the phone and she had to, because he had it, I had, I also worked at the time in the financial services industry. And I know that if you have a securities license or an investment license and you have a restraining order, they actually have restrictions or you can get fired. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to go down the restraining order route and, um, but he refused to leave. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, it's kind of like, I'm giving you a very short abbreviated version because it's actually two instances that led to that, mm -hmm. that point. But um, it was the one that actually led to the actual getting the restraining order was after I got him to leave, he came back, went into the front seat of my car and I didn't, and I was scared to death. He was doing something to my brake lines or doing something like that um, because I had a issue with the car that was driving his children and he didn't care if I popped a tire and flipped it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a problem. So that led down that route. And then it was when I dealt with family court, I was mortified at what that was where I really got to realize that me thinking I was equal to a man in this country really became apparent that I wasn't, that I was treated as subhuman. I was treated as less than. I was treated as if I was an animal. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I actually, I kind of just had the vision of, it was like, I was on a farm, you know, a mass farm of cows and I'm stuck in this corral and all I'm allowed to do is be inseminated and impregnated and then have my children ripped away from me so they can steal my milk, mm -hmm. you know? And then I had no say, I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. And that was... That was, a, you know, and back then, nobody believed me. Everybody thought I was fucking batshit crazy that this shit happens. Mm -hmm. And the first judge that gave him custody ex parte, well, first of all, he convinced me to lift a restraining order because of the securities license issue. And it was putting the house into foreclosure. And I didn't realize it was a, it was a classic chess move oh. at the time. And he did it intentionally to get me to drop the restraining order. And so I did. So he waited two months, not paying child support. We actually had a pending contempt 
There was also some very troubling behaviors of my children that I wanted to have my children evaluated for inappropriate touching. Mm. And so we had everything set in place. You know, you know, as the system takes time. Mm -hmm. Next thing I know, while we were waiting in those two weeks, he, in the meantime, went in and got ex parte custody. Okay. By a judge who was removed by the FBI six weeks later for corruption. Okay. <laughs> wow. So, wow. yes. So <laughs> all you have to do is just look up Judge Michael Livingston. He ended up doing a plea deal, so he still gets his pension. No, um, no, no, no. So, and if he would have looked at just the case file, um, he would have probably, have, you know, have not given my ex-husband custody. So, um, and then as we know what happens when we're dealing with a judge that was already found guilty of corruption, all the other judges double down on protecting whatever orders they had in place. So I don't know if this was a judge shopping issue or it was just coincidence, but we ended up with a pro father's rights judge, Judge James Menno, who I spent almost 15 years trying to get removed from the bench. Oh. Um, and I'll tell you what happened as a consequence for me trying. But he ended up upholding this judge's order without consequence, despite the case history of domestic violence behind it and gave me supervised visitations that I had to pay for, right. suspended, didn't even acknowledge the child support that was already in arrears prior to this, which to this day, I have never been able to collect on the child support that he had owed, that he was in arrears prior to getting custody. Okay. Every time we brought it up, every time we filed issues with it, every time the orders came back, with nothing being addressed about the child support he owed me. Okay. So um, he ended up not complying with court orders. Of course. Uh, to make a long story short, he, in 2009, um, he, uh, that judge who was the profile of the judge who denied, by the way, a hundred percent of our motions, we had a gateway. He denied a hundred percent of our witnesses. He approved a hundred percent of my ex-husbands. I mean, you can't get any more bias than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and there were times when we would file contempt, he would come in with I'm not kidding you, four inch thick of 20 something motions. And then the focus ended up going on that and not what we were in court for, okay? And not even about the children, but about what I'm posting on social media. He started stalking me and creating fake Facebook accounts and friend requesting me. Mm -hmm. And then knowing what was scary is he knew who my accountant was somehow and friend requested them. He somehow knew the pastor of my church and friend requested them. So sometimes when you accept friend requests, I thought I was being very careful. And I'm like, oh, well, this person has, they know my accountant, they know my my oh. uh, pastor of my church, they knew so-and-so, mm -hmm. so they must be safe, okay? Because like, who knows those people that don't know each other, right? Right. And it wasn't like a lot of people. And, you know, that was scary where we came to realization in 2012, how he was able to do that. But um, so in 2009, he, he uh, wasn't complying with court orders. And so the judge for the first time started, uh, he allowed me to speak. He allowed me to produce evidence for the first time um, because my ex started accusing me the last time I had visitation at that point was during uh, the summer and we had a pool and you know we were kind of horsing around like we do right and so we were doing things with ice cubes because it was like 95 degrees right. outside and we were going around saying who can get who and whose bathing suit some ice cubes right we were just laughing about it well he turned that into i was abusing my kids i was forcing them to sit on ice cold ice cubes and all this other stuff and I said, Gerardo, I actually have pictures in my purse right here, right now. I'm not claiming to be the most perfect parent. Who is? I go, but we are dealing with somebody with a history of abuse. And that's him. Documented through psych psych uh, psychiatry, through DCF, through the police reports, 
Okay. Like mm -hmm. not to mention, by the way, I forgot to forget within three months of him getting custody, my daughter was seen by the pediatrician three times for sudden urinary tract infections. What do we know is the number one cause of that? Mm -hmm. She never had that before when she was in my custody. And she would hyperventilate on the toilet saying she couldn't get oh. up because daddy had to wipe her. Oh. Okay. So I can't, I can't, I'm not making any accusations. I'm stating just facts. Mm -hmm. So um, it, that's not normal. And the fact that my pediatrician put in the file, in the medical record, that he questioned inappropriate touching to a guy that also has a restraining order against him in the same patient file, that he never did a physical exam, nor did he, Dr. Stephen Lane at a situate, who I filed a complaint against the Medical Board Association, because he, as legally obligated, when you have a question like that, and you have a guy that you know had a restraining order against him three months earlier, then you have an obligation. If you don't want to exam, you have an obligation to report to DCF, and he didn't either. And then so when a report was filed to DCF, he actually refuted his own medical records to protect his own license, because he knows he can serve a jail, a year in jail time for failing to report. Okay. So that is kind of what happened, all this kind of chaos. So when Judge Menno finally decided to listen to me in two, December 2000, uh, September 2009, sorry, um, he saw the photos and knew my ex-husband was lying. Do you want to see the photos from the day he's talking about? I got them right here. And he, he goes, okay, I want to see them. First time he allowed evidence. Okay. And our, my case started in 2005 the first time with the abuse. So that's four years later, okay? And he got custody in 2007. So the first time in two years, I was allowed evidence for the first time. So that judge who was a known profile of the judge recused himself for the for, in my case, admitting bias, ordering my, my ex-husband to not ignore court orders and to comply. Well, he basically said, fuck you to the judge. The second judge refused to hear our contempt for a year and a half until we finally had a trial <laughs> in 2011. So up until then, he wasn't complying. I went another two years not seeing my kids until right before the trial. Then I got three months. I got to see them once for like two hours a week. Okay. In that time frame, my partner's ex-husband, uh, my partner's wife, almost ran over my father as, as the meetup to pick up the kids. She, he, she sped up and then slammed on the brakes, almost hitting him and running him over intentionally to scare him. Oh. Um, and my father filed a complaint and we also notified the courts, all these things. My kids were scared. One of them went into fetal position on my father's bed. And I, and I had a talk with her like, well, what's going on? What's going on? And she wouldn't talk to me. They were gagged. And so that whole thing kind of spiraled, but then to make up, to kind of keep going, because I can go on and on and on about all the little nuances. Mm -hmm. In 2011, we finally had our trial and we thought we finally had the ace in the bag mm -hmm. because my ex-husband was the last to testify. And my attorney, well, first one thing, my ex-husband, this is why we coined him Clark Rockefeller, <laughs> He convinced a judge that my father's legitimate signature on a piece of paper was a forgery. Okay. Because like the stories he would tell, it was just, it was mind boggling. And, mm -hmm. and he, he was a gifted liar. That's why we coined him Clark Rockefeller because we didn't know how, how else to, if you really want to know who you were dealing with, this is, and he knew how to play Darvo like, like, a, like he should have gone to acting school. Okay. Oh, yeah. A drop um, queen. I mean, my, my paralegal who had been, who had been a paralegal for almost 40 years, almost quit her entire profession over my case. And she also said that my ex-husband was the best con man that she had ever seen on the stand in her entire career. All right. <laughs> oh, I bet. 
Uh, I mean, he has defrauded and committed securities transactions, still has a fucking license. We have all the evidence, mm -hmm. but he lawyered up and would make some cockamamie story. And the problem is, is they go, well, it's the father-in-law. So uh, we're not going to get into family disputes. Wait a minute. He embezzled my father's entire retirement account, put my elderly father in bankruptcy. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Yes, we oh. have all the evidence. And I mean, he committed a securities transaction without a license at the time. Okay. The check was made in his name. Like you can't get any like, like dumber gets dumber, gets dumber with evidence. Okay. Oh. So all of this is proven in the trial. He, at the end, we also got him to admit, because I said, we have to get him to admit because at that point, he had violated about 95, 97% of the visitation order since 2007. We're in 2011. So that's how much I didn't have any access to my children. Mm -hmm. No no talk, no see, no nothing. And, and you're dealing with the formative years. So if my youngest was four, you're dealing with she was nine now. So there's a lot of damage that was done in that time frame. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he admitted on the stand that he had no intention of ever complying with court orders. So the court <laughs> orders come down in 2012. In this, in the spring of 2012, I, she gave my abuser full legal and physical custody of my children. She found him guilty of violating about 95, 97%. I forget what the exact number was percent of the visitation, but sanctioned me 20 thousand dollars to give him and who he uh, he bankrupted me i had i was on the verge of losing my teaching position because of the level of abuse and stalking and harassment that i was engaged in um including like you know nails and screws where auto dealerships actually would say to me did somebody put these here Mm -hmm. So I couldn't prove it. And even the police department had me keep a log of, we can't prove that he did it, but you know, it's the circumstance, blah, 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 blah. But my ex wasn't doing it. I think himself, mm -hmm. he was very good at somehow convincing third party people to do it for him because he would play victim. Like I was the psycho mm -hmm. ex-wife that is just trying to destroy him in his business that I built, by the way, I um, built it. I hired him into it. He somehow converted my contracts and took me out of it without my knowledge. And I ended up, when I got divorced, I walked away from it because I just did the math in my head. I go, I can build another business mm -hmm. successfully because I did it once before. It's not worth, all the money will end up going to all these experts and it'll be, a, I don't want to do that to the kids. Right. Right. Yeah. So I walked away from the business thinking I was doing the right thing instead of realizing I empowered him mm -hmm. by doing that. All right. So, um, to that, so I appealed that case who was in the, the judge who was at that point, judge? judge Lisa Roberts, who just retired finally and judge Menno retired. They, he was getting heat. So they changed him and moved him like the Catholic church did into another court district. Oh. Um, we had 20 cases at the time when I was doing data and research and collection. We had 20 solid cases that attracted uh, a 2020 reporter at the time. And I said, geez, you know, I must be doing something right if it's attracting national attention. Mm -hmm. But back then we didn't even have Facebook. Okay. So it was like, you know, we didn't have podcasts. We didn't have you know, I relied on a blog. I relied, no, actually we did have Facebook towards the end because mm -hmm. I did create a Facebook account specifically for, called Justice for um, Kelly, Shannon, and, and Allie. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, while my case was pending appeal, somehow she he, he convinced the judge to incarcerate me for $300 in child support that wasn't taken out by DOR yet because we were in the great recession then. Oh my God. So she was pissed that I got DOR involved and DOR didn't take out the payment. She said, well, just cut them a check. I said, you're telling me to cut a check to a man who's already been investigated for fraud, who tried to, who flooded my house and then tried to commit an insurance scam, 
who also had six slip and falls prior to my marriage with lawsuits attached, you want me to give him access to my banking information? Mm -mm. No. DOR even thought I was crazy. Like, what are you doing calling us? Because like, we'll come down and hunt you down if you don't. I said, I'd rather I trust you more than I trust him. I don't want him having access to my banking information and routing numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He has a securities license. Like, do you realize what he can do with that information? He has already done it before and got away with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, he stole a $30,000 insurance check after flooding my house. Okay. Oh. And got away with it. He, he embezzled my father's entire retirement account and got away with it because he used it was family. It was a gift. That's what he told everybody. He said it was a gift. Who the fuck gives you their entire retirement account before retirement? Oh. Especially to somebody who's not family. Like, <laughs> right. Oh my so God. It's like all oh, these crazies. Right. But he was so good at the, at the con game mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, I, I I don't know. Like I was afraid to even go to the police anymore. I was afraid to do anything anymore because he just had everybody eating on a silver platter. And I don't know what he was that having them convince me, uh, you know, PTSD, I'm sorry, is not a mental illness. Mm -hmm. PTSD would go away if you just stop abusing me. <laughs> right. You know, PTSD and my ability to be normal would go away if you just move on with your fucking life and stop uh -huh. stalking me, stop putting nails in my tires, stop breaking into the office, stop stop trying to hack into my health care, stop trying to pretend. I mean, I had to put so many safeguards of him trying to hack into my health records and requesting medical information on me. He called my employer and, and tried to pretend that he was me to access employment records. And I'm like, first of all, easy thing, go get a fucking subpoena. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, why are you doing it that way? And so it was all those things. So in 2013, he convinced a judge while I had a pending appeal, by the way, to incarcerate me 30 day sentence plus six months of criminal court um, uh, community service four days a week. How well am I going to hold on a job if I'm doing four days a week? criminal court community so do you ask the taxpayer oh <laughs> tell me okay okay yeah so you're talking pro approximately sixty thousand dollars it cost the taxpayers for three hundred dollars that dor didn't take out yet the money was there uh-huh it was just because of the recession it was it was a systems issue with the government okay so and so then, okay, so he wanted you to be incarcerated. Then he Right, so, so even after I got, so when I got out, that actually cost me my job at the college, oh. okay? So I ended up getting laid off. I had to file for unemployment. And um, unemployment took three months to kick in because, yeah. of, because it was the Great Recession. They had more applicants than they had staff. So he kept begging the judge to incarcerate me for six months to teach me a lesson. Oh. And that's where I do the spirit work. So I went in one day, I saw all the bailiffs in the room. It was already premeditated. By the way, my incarceration was premeditated because when his lawyer called to pretend to be me to access my records at the college, I went and tried to get a harassment protection order against him oh. at another court. He sat there and I have this all documented in a blog, a blogger. And I said, he said, your honor, she's going to jail anyway, as if it was a stated fact. This was two weeks before me going to jail. Oh. Okay? And he said, and I, so I'm sitting there going, so how is that possible unless one, a backroom deal has already been done or two, he's lying. You cannot, he either just perjured himself or he made a backroom deal. Mm -hmm. You can't have it both ways. How does he know I'm already going to jail before it even fucking happened? Right. Okay. So I want to, I meant to preface that. 
So when it came to the six months, they kept the, and they wanted to do it. The judge was looking for something to, to silence me because I wasn't just talking about my case. I was talking about the 20 other cases and gathering data and statistics on this other judge, Judge James Menno, and trying to get him removed from the bench. So, and, and there were two documented sex, child sex abuse cases where in one of the cases he told the mother that if she, he ever find that she was lying again, she will never see her son again. Okay, I, we had the transcripts. So I read the transcripts. It isn't just me saying it. I read the transcripts. And I saw also the pictures that were drawn by this six-year-old child who threatened to kill himself jumping out of a therapist's window just to avoid to go see daddy. Mm. So this is, this is the stuff that I was, they were punishing me for. And they were using my kids to try to silence me. And I, and I think what happened was I saw this was bigger than even my own story and they weren't going to silence me no matter how long they incarcerate. I don't care if I fucking end up dead and they, and they somehow kill me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to stay silent. Um, I did stay silent for a while after a Supreme court case in 2000, December came out in December, 2019 is when I took a break from the advocacy. Yeah. Um, because a Supreme court came out full well knowing this was a documented domestic violence case and violated the best child, uh, best interest of the child statute and gave custody to a documented domestic abuser because he had the financial means and she didn't, which mean, which is code word for, yeah, we know he's financially abusing her, but we're not, we're still going to give him custody and reward him with that behavior. So I, I got frustrated saying they just gave abusers case law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until like, you know, uh, and, and that point, my ex was supposed to still be complying with visitations and everything else and phone calls wasn't complying, stopped even allowing, but because I had the $20,000 sanction, I knew if I didn't pay that money off, I was going to, they were going to use it as an excuse to throw me in jail because I didn't fully pay it off. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any me. So I wasn't able to pay it off until 2000, I think 18 or 19. And then I went into court and that's, uh, and then by the time I found a lawyer that was willing to take the case because of the complexity of it at that stage, a lot of these lawyers go, we're not touching this for less than 20 grand retrainer retainer. You know, this is a psycho case. And, um, but I did finally find a lawyer who seemed to be, I was nervous because she's not a domestic violence lawyer, but she's, she also grew up in the inner city as a woman of color. So I knew she knew how to stand up to oppression, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is the same thing as what women of domestic violence go through. And I think we forget the parallels, right? Mm -hmm. That what people of color go through is the same thing. We, we are fighting the same system of what victims of domestic violence are fighting. And if we can unify both voices, we would have a huge unified voice. So I hired her the first day of the first day of our here. Well, I found out my ex moved in violation of court order to another state without my permission and without court permission moved my children to another state. He didn't show up to a single freaking hearing. I'm still in the case. So like my case is still technically open and my youngest is 20. Because in Massachusetts, I tried to see about getting it transferred to Florida because he moved to Florida and I was told we can't do that because it's the case of origin. I go, yeah, but he moved to, to Florida. And in Florida, I wouldn't have to pay child support anymore because it's 18 is the statute, not 23 in Massachusetts. Mm. When he's the one that violated court law, court ruling, court order, and moved my kids without permission and without my knowledge and contacting me. I didn't stop giving up on my kids. He stopped giving me access to my kids. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't have the financial resources because at that point, my legal bill was $325,000. And I did develop limited disabilities because of the toll it took on my health. Mm -hmm. So now to go into how I did these, the books and the podcast, 
it started in 2014. I said, okay, I thought that since I wasn't winning legally mm -hmm. and my bill just kept getting bigger and she somehow got my appeal to be dropped because of the six months of constant um, community service was a strategy by the judge to get me to miss a deadline for the appeal mm. because she stopped harassing me when the appeal was dropped. Okay. Oh. And I had another lawyer who was a corporate lawyer and tell them when they were threatening me with incarceration, tell her that you're not answering a single thing unless you get a lawyer and that you have a right to a lawyer because you're being threatened with incarceration. And she's like, well, you can answer yes or no. I said, no, your honor. And I'm putting this on record. You are threatening me with six months incarceration, which is a criminal act that you are charging me with. And I am entitled with no justification for that six months. And I'm entitled to a lawyer under the law. Mm -hmm. That was the last time I was in her courtroom. Because prior to that, I was in her courtroom every single month being harassed, berated, threatened, and abused in the courtroom. So after that episode ended in 2014, I had to start allowing the grief and the processing with the hope of my oldest is going to be 18 in a couple of years. She's mm -hmm. going to want to seek me out. And I started doing a more of a deeper dive into my healing work, mm -hmm. getting that more established, getting, uh, and I started thriving. Prior to that, I was not thriving because I was caught. You, you can't thrive mm -mm. if you're constantly having bombs dropped, dropped on top of you. Like, like what we see in Gaza. You cannot thrive and be a productive human person in society if you're constantly having bombs dropped on top of you every day, whether you're being stalked, whether you're being harassed whether you're being in the courtroom, I was having it hit at me on every angle, including, by the way, my ex-husband charged me, tried charging me four times, four times for larceny, forgery, and uttering a false check on money that legally came out of my bank account on a house that legally belonged to me. And somehow in Massachusetts, you can file criminal charges over and over and over and over again. Oh. As much as you want. And the last time he pulled the race card, tell him I said some awful names to him and try to pull the Darvo tactic and try to make it a race issue. And the, and the clerk was like, you've been here three times before and it's been dismissed. I don't know how you're going to find an angle on this one now. And I'm like, shit, if I would have known that this was possible, why couldn't we have gone this route when he embezzled my father's entire retirement account? We didn't even know we could go that route. We went through oh. the police department. Well, like legitimate. No. Yeah. You know, like, like these are things like only con people know how to do, mm -hmm. you know, they know how to use the system to continue the perpetuation of abuse because it was, you know, and, and it affected me getting a job because the first three at least were allowed to get to the judge. So now it showed, so it was only dismissed after the arraignment. You know, but they didn't they didn't dismiss it in the right way. Like, it was like, wait a minute, so you're allowing the abuser to come back and continue to refile this so he can go to family court and say, see, your honor, she's a crook, she's a criminal, see? Like, and I'm like, wait a minute, but this was on an account, like, do you, your honor, do you see what he's doing? Like, this was legally my house, deeded my house out of an account that was my bank account. His name wasn't even associated on it. And he is allowed to continue to do this. That is malicious prosecution. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is abuse. Yes. And here's the kicker. He, I don't know how he did this. He got the criminal clerk to somehow have me arraigned without my rights. You know how he did it? He Xeroxed the first criminal complaint, whited out the docket numbers, whited out the dates and, and changed them and had me arraigned. When I filed a complaint against him, with the attorney general's office wanting, demanding, because my attorney goes, this needs to be investigated. Like this is criminal. This is criminal. All right. And I had a meeting with the DA's office and the criminal clerk and they pep up, pep up. Okay. Well, no, that's your department. You have, because they don't want to investigate their own. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So when I went to the attorney general's office within 30 days, they uh, somehow he resigned and retired early. Interesting. Okay? Within 30 days of my criminal complaint. I didn't see the complaint. I didn't see the second charge until after because the clerk's office said, we can't find that file, right? So a new clerk came in and I demanded that file. Said, By the way, here's my copy. So mm -hmm. don't sit there and tell me it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. They finally gave it to me and that's when I found out. And I also have it on audio tape talking and yelling at the clerk, the first clerk that resigned. And I told, by the way, I did this legally because <laughs> he knew I was tape recording him. And I got him to admit he tried to blame the judge or the judge authorized him to do so. I said, no judge is going to authorize you to white out docket numbers and change dates and have me arraigned without a fair hearing. Oh. That's, 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 that, that is a violation of my constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that stuff all happened. So from like 2014 though, I needed that break to really kind of heal after almost 10 years of being bombarded nonstop of abuse. So I was in court longer than I was married to this man Ugh. being abused. Okay. And using my children as weapons and pawns. And, um, my, my kids never got the help that they were, by the way, and they were court ordered to have psychotherapy. He stopped all of it to silence them so he can control them, manipulate them, gaslight them, Stockholm them, do all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know to this day what he has said to them because my hope was when they turned 18, they would want to, they would want to find me and, and seek me out. My oldest is now going to be 27. She's a mother. And I've only in the last two years been able to find them on without being blocked on her and my middle daughter on Instagram. They don't engage with me. They don't respond to my messages. Uh -huh. They don't respond to my comments. It is disheartening to see that I'm a grandmother now and I have no access to a child. But the, the abuser and the one that harmed my children has complete access. That's sickening. So I have turned my mission into, I, I've, i this is not like a, I'm giving up. I think that's the misconception when we go through this. I'm not giving up on my kids. I hope every day. And if you see my Instagram, which is the healing trauma through spirit on Instagram page, I have a thing where I plead and I said, I might, my dream is like my Christmas wish is that my daughter knocks on my door and, and I open it and I see her standing there and I hug her and I just want to hold her and tell her how much I've loved her. I've missed her and I've never given up on her. Mm -hmm. But I also know me staying and grieving and mourning is exactly what he wants because that's punishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have to have a level of acceptance of what is, and that level of acceptance is statistically, I probably will never see my kids again. Mm -hmm. And he won. Well, he won. And, but this is where I am turning that failure of how I failed in family court is I'm on the track coalition. We have 70 pending domestic violence bills in Massachusetts right now, or I'm on track to uh, pass the coercive control bill. We also have a bill on litigation abuse. We also have a bill on a moratorium on building a women's prison because the family court judges are using that to silence women mm -hmm. as the new insane asylum. I just helped a survivor last year um, in the same court, different judge. This judge, by the way, is Judge Denise Mehar. So what, what to kind of transition, what I've taken in my case and my situation and what I've learned, both from advocating for myself, the failures, the losses, the grief, and what and how I can turn that into a now. Mm -hmm. The difference between the two times, one, 
I had politicians back then that flat out told me they couldn't get involved in my case because it'd be political suicide. Mm -hmm. I had um, lawyers that wouldn't be involved in my case for the same reason. I had police departments that some of them saw what was going on and they were powerless to help me to do anything and rectify. They didn't know how to help me because they knew at the end of the day, the judges overturn anything that the police departments do. Oh. Okay. So um, that was hard that I was basically felt like I was a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. And the harder I fought, the quicker I was drowning. The more I kept saying, hand me a life preserver, the more one was taken with it. One was thrown at me, but it was just a far enough away. I couldn't reach it. Okay. Um, I had domestic violence shelters that hung me out mm -hmm. and didn't support me. And so they were no longer a safe space for me. The difference between what I saw almost 20 years ago to now is we have legislators in right now in the state of Massachusetts. Our state auditor, Diana DiZaglio, is a fucking badass. She went from state senator, though, to state auditor with a mission of auditing the legislature. And I have been in communication with her to audit the family courts. Awesome. We also have state legislators, state reps, and state senators that are hearing us, are filing motions and legislative bills on our behalf. They're no longer saying that it's political suicide. We have state legislators that are former prior survivors of either sexual assault or domestic violence. We have former we have legislators that are former advocates of shelters. So they see the problem. Mm -hmm. And I've always said back then, I said, the way to fix this is we need survivors to, to overcome, even if it means you never see your kids again, mm -hmm. to become a politician or to become a lawyer. We have to become part of the system to fix the system from the inside out, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that. Like, I never thought I would see that. That is what I feel like is working in our favor. Mm -hmm. Is it gonna happen like this year? I don't know. But if it happens in 10 years, then guess what? It happened in my lifetime. Right. Okay. Because the hardest thing to tell a survivor is once that damage is done, it may not be repairable to, unless, unless a miracle happens. Yeah. Right. So how do you turn that pain into changing the very thing that harmed you? So it doesn't continue to harm your children and other people's children. And in September, it was interesting when I testified on the coercive control bill and the litigation abuse bill. It was a long day. I ended up being the last person to testify for the day. <laughs> and I kind of, I didn't say everything. She had three minutes because I was so stuck on, oh my God, you have no idea. I've waited 20 years for this day right. to sit here. And is it a coincidence that I am the last does that mean I'm going to make the most impact on you? I don't know, but I've waited 20 years. I haven't seen my kids since mm. 2011. They were taken away from me in 2007. Like I've had no real relationship with my kids since 2007 mm. because I've only been able to see maybe 20 hours of visitations with them from 2007 to 2011, if that. Right. So it's not really having a relationship with your kids. It just happens to be the last time I actually saw them. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, that this never ends because I'm still in court. My ex with my new lawyer, new judge, Judge Stanton, which I don't even know if I should be mentioning his name because of the, but maybe we should. I don't know. But I was a little disheartened that. He kept ordering my ex to show up in court after four or five times of my ex not showing up in court, him giving him a pass and okay. then constantly continuing the hearings because my ex was the one not complying with court orders, still didn't comply with filing a, a financial statement, still not complying with showing up. 
my lawyer being harassed, bullied, threatened, and abused by his lawyer that outside the courtroom, which, which brought up four or five court officers, her complaining to the judge saying that she was being abused and accosted by the, the attorney. And it basically say he didn't care, deal with it on record, told this lawyer to deal with it, to deal with the being abused by another lawyer, which is unprofessional misconduct. Oh. Okay. And so I had to settle out of court, which he knew. All right, he knew. He knew the game. And the game mm -hmm. was because I wanted child support terminated. He refused to give me my daughter's phone number. So we have that on record. Mm -hmm. As of before mm -hmm. she turns 18, you can still give me a phone number to contact her until she says to my face she doesn't want to speak to me. The judge could have ordered that before she turned 18 and chose not to. Under the guise of, well, she'll, she'll be 18 soon anyway. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, God, like what? So then, if you're if you're gonna basically terminate all my rights, and and first of all, I'm only supposed to pay child support if she's in college. He refused to provide any evidence besides his mouth that has been already been a lie to begin with, to prove any evidence that she's in college. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were able to get. So what we ended up negotiating was that I pay him twenty five dollars a week, which we know is not about the child support now; it's about control. Right. Exactly. It says still have control because every time I have to pay that, it's not about me paying child support. It's a reminder mm -hmm. of who. Good point. It's a daily reminder of who's still in charge and I am still not free. Oh. And so I was afraid like when this book came out feisty. Mm hmm. So I wrote a chapter in there. The chapter is called hashtag me Too family courts. And that chapter, my publisher convinced me that the chapter needed to be about my incarceration story. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why it's in the middle of the book, not in the beginning and not in the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because clearly it's a heavy read. Um, But it, I go into things like all, you, all you've ever asked for is to be free from abuse. It's all you've ever asked. Please mm -hmm. stop the abuse. And then you get thrown in handcuffs. You wake up in the middle of the night in a cell and they're popping pills down your throat. You have no idea what pills they're popping down. You have no idea what they are, what they're for. You didn't give them permission. And, you know, all these things that were violations and being treated as a criminal for what, $300 that DOR didn't take out and I'm being abused? So that really spoke volumes to me, but it also taught me something. That is why I became outspoken about the moratorium of the women's prison bill. Mm -hmm. It was because what I found out was about a third of the women that were in Framingham State Penitentiary in Massachusetts with murderers, rapists, and everybody else some pretty sick murderers, mm -hmm. about a third of them were sent there by family courts. One of them was sent there. Get this. She was 26 years old. She was a single mom of her child. And again, she lost her job because of the recession. So she had to move in to her parents' house. She ended up having to sleep on the sofa. So because she didn't have proper housing, for her and her six-year-old son, mm -hmm. daddy went back, who didn't give a shit, wasn't paying child support, wasn't even showing up for visitations, now got custody. The she was said, she, she, why? Because it was a recession. Okay. And the, the judges one, didn't care. Judges didn't care. No. So um, she was the sole provider of the six-year-old boy prior to that. Okay. Before that, apparently the father even tried to deny paternity. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it was, it was like one of those cases. So when I learned about her case, she actually got seriously physically ill. And, and while I was there, so I was, I was doing some homeopathic treatments that I learned how to do that. I learned prior to going there. And it's actually kept me, it's probably what kept me alive because all these women wanted to beat me up and, and accost me until they realized that maybe they could 
I let them use me in a different way. <laughs> oh man. So, um, but this girl was there for the wrong reasons and mm -hmm. she was sent there. Get this. 5,000. She had, she had to come up. She had 30 days to come up with 5,000 to pay his lawyer. Well, it was the peak of the recession. She couldn't get a job. She didn't even have unemployment. Basically was on the verge of homelessness now. And the, so she went to jail. So when she came out of jail after serving 30 days, she had 30 days to come up with $5,000. Okay. Or she went back for 60 days. Guess what happened? Mm -hmm. She had 30 days to come back. And after 30 days, come up with $5,000 or she went back for 90 days. So by the time I met her, she was serving seven months in jail for civil infractions of not being able to pay a lawyer. That's the, scary. Well, because guess what? Family court judges are the only judicial branch that can incarcerate you indefinitely for an indeterminate amount of time against your will. Think about it. It's mm -hmm. the new version of the insane asylum. And so far, out of all the people speaking out on the moratorium of the women's prison in Massachusetts, I have been the only voice about why it needs to be a moratorium because of what family court judges are using it for. Everything else, everybody else speaking out it is because of the criminalization and what happens to women as a result, which I get, it's not to diminish. But I still am and the only one speaking out on why the prison shouldn't be be allowed to be built to give family court judges permission to continue patterns of abuse and silence victims by locking them up for an indeterminate amount of time because it's not criminal. So it doesn't go on your record. So the woman I saved last year was give, was threatened with a six months incarceration by Judge Denise Mayhar. Because she had a medical episode and a medical crisis. She wasn't even the case judge of record. If you go look up Judge Janice Mayhar, so for all the cases that have come forward with me, they all make my cases, make what I went through look like a walk in the park, mm -hmm. but they were dream judges compared to what's happening now in Massachusetts. This judge, Judge Janice Mayhar, I have yet to find is the case judge on any of the cases that she is listening to why is she not listed as the case judge on any of the cases she is rendering decisions on it is a deliberate intent to cover up and hide the fact that she was removed from worcester court to plymouth court that may have led to the deaths of two women which i have yet to find the evidence for so this is speculation what i'm about to say Mm -hmm. Because I'm very clear about evidence. If you're going to win this battle, it can't be emotion-based. It has to be evidence-based. Mm -hmm. That the pre-things pre I have come across may have been as a result of two victims that she didn't die of restraining order to who died in her courtroom, basically as a result of her orders, with multiple complaints against her for uh, ignoring domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I have had people that work in the system that which I'm trying to be very obscure to protect them mm -hmm. from retaliation uh, but multiple people who have told me that she was told to, that she cannot have any cases as her punishment she's just supposed to be covering for other judges so uh -huh. what they're doing is that they're putting these cases in other judges because when I ask these survivors did these case judges who were listed as case judge ever hear your case? No. Mm -hmm. So why is Judge Denise Mayhar not listed as case judge? This is not being transparent to the American people. This is not transparent to those that are collecting data and statistics. Mm -hmm. Because you can't go say, I want to see Judge Denise Mayhar's case files in history. Because you, there aren't any. That. They're in other judges' names mm -hmm. where she's, and in this case with, with, with Sheila, um, Sheila didn't go to jail because of what, how we worked that. 
the advice that she, that I coached her on. And that made me happy because I may not, I, you know, I, it may have cost me because back then there wasn't a team we, where there was nobody there to help me, mm-hmm. but I have enough knowledge and training in multiple areas that now I have it, but because of what I went through is also the ace in the bag is because I went in prison. I got to see what happened in there. I got to talk to women and Mm -hmm. find out what happened, why they were there and why the judges put them there. Okay. So I don't necessarily see me going to prison was a bad thing because I wouldn't have known otherwise. I would have been one of those arrogant, ignorant assholes like half of us are. They're like, oh, well, if they went to prison, they went there because they deserved it. They had to have done something wrong. Mm -mm. Okay. So it's the same, but it's the same plight of what we hear the BIPOC community talking about the wrongful incarcerations. So, I mean, there's parallels here. Mm -hmm. There's direct parallels here. Of what the black and brown community says about how how the how the you know they're massively i mean we're seeing it happen in mississippi right Mm -hmm. where they uncovered how many how many graves of murdered individuals that were persons of color that were murdered probably by the sheriff's department and tortured to death right and whatever because of still jim crow shit still going on down there Mm -hmm. but it's the same shit here i can't speak to that what I can say is witnessing and listening to black and brown people, listening to their stories and the same thing, listening to Palestinians now, what they're going through in Gaza and mothers, please saying, please protect me, my children. We're dying here. Mm. Miscarriages are up 300% over there. Mm. And people don't give a fuck. They, had, they were forced to abandon their newborns to come back to the newborns are being chewed on by stray dogs. Mm. Okay, like mm. this is like, dystopia Mm -hmm. but it's the same system that is harming the very thing that i'm talking about there is an intersectionality of the same oppressor across the board and i think if we can also see the bigger picture we can come to how do we unify voices you know and for us white women that are victims and if we don't see a parallel with systemic racism then maybe we have to unpack our own inner racism to see it Mm -hmm. And we can do that because that's what's helped me being white privileged, not realizing I didn't think I was racist until I realized, well, maybe you are in a way because like you're white privileged. You grew up in an upper middle class town and your dad was a doctor and your mom was a nurse. And, you know, you didn't have to walk down the street and think be accused just walking down the street and being accused that you robbed this bank or something just because Mm -hmm. of the color of your skin. Right. Mm -hmm. So and I and I because I hear this from brown and Uh, black folk here in Massachusetts where they won't drive through certain towns because just the mere fact that the cop sees them driving through that town now we think of Boston being very liberal but this is still happening here if you listen to their voices Mm -hmm. they don't drive through certain towns because they don't want to be pulled over because of the color of their skin Right? right so it's the same system so we have these bills that I'm hoping there is resistance because the judges don't want to have some of these bills pass. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't think they don't want, they want the control, you know, and we don't realize when we give power to simple freedoms, like, you know, like we did it in nine 11, right? Yes. Scan me, pat me down because I want under the guise of being safe. We don't realize that certain demographics are going to be packed down more just because of the color of their skin or the sex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why the ERA hasn't passed. There's a reason why Trump and Biden have refused to publish the ERA. Do you realize those that are listening here that that is the number one reason why family court judges can legally discriminate against you in family court because we are legally second-class citizens. Men have more rights to our children than we do legally until that passes. And it was even worsened after Trump elected who they did into Supreme Court and took away Roe. Roe has a lot more to do with women's rights than abortion. 
because in the row, when they overturned that, mm -hmm. it had to do with them not seeing women as a person under the constitution. That was huge. That if we are not deemed as a person under the constitution, therefore we don't have constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. This goes way beyond Roe. It mm -hmm. goes beyond healthcare freedom. It goes your ability and your freedom to rear your children the way you want, under the religion that you want, under the medical care that you want, under the education system that you want. I mean, I have seen in my 20 years since then, parents losing custody to even the system because the system did not like how they were raising their kids off grid to teach mm -hmm. them how to be survivalists. To me, I think that's the best thing you could teach your kid. I'm sorry. Well, exactly. like, like, I, I, like, I give no. his parents credit as long as they're loving and it's, and it's, and it's a healthy situation, but like, I can't believe like this is where we're at. I mean, we had cases, was it Justina Pelletier, where this is a case against medical discrimination, mm -hmm. where they came to Boston Children's Hospital and they were accused of child abuse when she had a medical condition that she went there to be treated for. And the system says basically, no, you can't treat your kid that way. And, and the, the level of trauma and, and medical abuse was like, so like the ERA has a lot more to do with, with our right to healthcare, our right to equal parenting. We are not just machines like a cow to just rear out and pop out babies mm -hmm. for the patriarchy, for them to do what they want with our children, because that's what's happening in family courts. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, I mean, that's Ugh. dystopia. This is Handmaid's Tale. We're at the beginning stages yes. of Handmaid's Tale. And the number one bill, if I can tell anybody to really focus on mm -hmm. over any domestic violence bill is the ERA. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden can direct the archivist to publish the ERA and he chooses not to. Mm -hmm. Why? And don't get me wrong, but because if we end up with Trump or Biden as the two to choose, they both refused to publish the ERA. They are both doing it. Why? They're both part of the same system. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, okay. Everyone's all connected. It's all connected. Just like the family court. Well, Marianne Williamson, and this is not just a political club, but she's the only elected candidate that has vowed to publish the ERA on day one to direct the archivist to do it. So, and that, that's, that says a lot, you know, um, we have to start getting involved in politics. We have to start how, and the, the key is, is how do we use what happened to us? Cause they can't, the politicians can't fix that, right? They can't fix what happened to us. Mm -hmm. But if we don't use our stories and say, this is not acceptable. And I demand change. Oh, you're a rapist and you're running for president? No, I'm not voting for you. Mm -hmm. That's how we, we use our power to vote. vote. If, you are, if you are voting, for instance, and saying, well, I'm voting for Trump because I like this economic policy, but you're not getting... You know, you're not getting the system to listen to you as a survivor, then you're putting that above your needs as a, as a survivor. You're basically saying that that isn't as important. Mm -hmm. And really and truly, that needs to be the number one thing because he put in three Supreme Court justices that it took away more women's rights. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. um, and, and, and you can't say that you're as a woman, as a survivor, if you are, then you're trauma bonding. And you really have to look at that and figure out why you're trauma bonding. Because some of us as women are doing the very same thing. We have not learned from our sisters of past. During the burning times of witches who sold mm -hmm. out our sisters mm -hmm. for power 
and gain and to get ahead. And we never got ahead. Mm -mm. With five, six, seven hundred years later, we are we are farther behind than we were a hundred years ago or 50 years yeah, ago. I agree okay? with that. So we have to learn and understand. And, it's, and I want to speak to specifically white women on this because this is primarily a white feminism, a white women issue that we sell out our, sister, our sisters for white male power. Mm -hmm. And then we sit there and complain that you want somebody to help you in your domestic violence, please help me. And I want, I want, you can't have it both ways. You can't scream victim and align with the abusers. Mm -hmm. The one thing anybody will learn about me, I am consistent in my word. Mm -hmm. If I make a mistake and I align with something because of ignorance or, or not knowing, I will admit to that and I will retract from that. Mm -hmm. But I will always, this is why I'm even a stark advocate for Palestinians, because I see what we survivors go through here as the same plight when I see a woman coddling a dead baby that was ripped apart because the Israelis consider that newborn a terrorist. Mm -hmm. It's all a mess. It's the same system. Mm -hmm. It's the same ideologies. We're doing it here, what we're doing there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, like the podcast, we call it Triggers and Spiritual Medicine because I like bridging in the, the medicine that helped me, but we can't heal without facing and addressing the hard truths. We have to be willing to have the courage to face these hard truths. Um, when I volunteered at the Domestic Violence Conference, it was a few years ago, they watched this documentary. And to me, it spoke everything. And it was a short film, and I forget what it was called. If anybody is out there can remind me what it was called, who saw it, please let me know, because I want to refine it again. And I, mm -hmm. I just can't. Um, but it shows like this woman, beautiful woman in like this garden of Eden with these beautiful flowers and butterfly, kind of like Snow Whitey, you know, mm -hmm. and this beautiful garden, this beautiful one tree in the middle, you know, this garden. And then she turns around and she sees this shadowy figure, looks like the Grim Reaper. Mm. And she almost goes, oh my God. And she like runs because like, this is a dangerous figure. This is a dangerous figure, right? Gotta run, gotta run, gotta run. And everywhere she turns, she's turning here, she's turning there, she's turning left, she's turning right. Everywhere she turns, she puts her head up and she sees somehow that figure is always in front of her and she can't seem to escape it. And then the panic and the anxiety and the stress gets him worse and she gets more worked up. I can't breathe. And she just acts and just turns and, and she bumps into him and she, she puts her head up and she sees a mirror. Mm -hmm. And that mirror is herself. Mm. Realizing that the shadows, the trauma, the pain, if you want to be free, the only way to be free is facing the hard truths that are within us, because that is what has helped me to be a voice for others. If I, I'm still stuck in my story and not releasing it from the tissues and not releasing it from my spirit, then I can't be there for others. I cannot help advocate for others as effectively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because eventually it does turn into illness and disease. Every oh, single person I have worked with that's got breast cancer had a history of either being a victim of child abuse, sexual abuse, or domestic violence. A hundred percent. So I've learned that over the decades and, and doing this work, both from healing and from advocacy, it's a balance. I've been working with a couple of moms in Massachusetts that have got some of these toxic judges. Oh, Yes. And my number one advice to them is the battle will be there, but for you to be there and to do the battle, you have to put self-care and learning how to regulate your nervous system as priority number one. Mm -hmm. Martyrdom will get you sick, diseased, 
disabled, dead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and I think we sometimes, because, you know, we want to throw ourselves in the line for our kids, but when we're dealing with the system, that doesn't work mm -hmm. because we actually come across as like this unhinged person. Mm -hmm. But if we put our self-care first, then that is like putting on your oxygen mask on a plane first and then your children, then you're able energetically, vibrationally, we're able to hold that power here and the judges are going to feel it. That's kind of how we helped. I helped Sheila last year, you know, is teaching her how to do this and how to, what to focus until we're able to help her find a lawyer go, you really need a lawyer because she was, she had gotten so traumatized by this judge that she can't, she can't be in front of this judge. She needs, she needs somebody to be her voice, mm -hmm. you know, and that that's, it's okay to not be okay. Right. right. So there's levels of acceptance of, yes, we got this battle. Yes, there's nothing wrong with me. What I'm experiencing is normal grief. It's normal trauma. And I just need to find a way to help my body process it so I can be there and fight for my children in the bigger battle with the courts. Whether it's how do we get this judge removed? Mm -hmm. How do we pass legislation? to audit the system so we can implement better systems? Mm -hmm. How do we get better so we can run for office and be that voice and change the system for our kids? Mm -hmm. Or we can go and become like those, those like there's so many pathways mm -hmm. beyond our story. You know, our what happened to us and the injustice in the courts, we can't undo that. And that's a hard truth we have to face because we can't fix it unless we accept what is. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean accept that your abuser deserved it, custody, right? Mm -hmm. It just means that it's just a matter of fact, right? The judge came in, took custody ex parte and awarded it to my abuser and I wasn't there. It, it doesn't mean that, well, it was so wrong. Yes, it was wrong. But if we stay stuck on it was so wrong, we get stuck in that and we can't move forward to fix it and find the remedy. I think you're doing a great job with these bills and speaking out. And how can people find your podcast? So I'm on every major streaming platform mm -hmm. and on YouTube. It's called Triggers and Spiritual Medicine. Okay. How can, okay. So I'm seeing your book, uh, Feisty and Secret. The other, one, the other one, Secrets to Healing. So that talks about my overall healing journey um, using Japanese therapies. The dragonfly mm -hmm. is actually the family crest for my Japanese teacher in Kyoto, Japan. And it was this Japanese therapy that really helped me unplug the PTSD aspect and helped me to start living more of a normal life. Mm -hmm. And, and I've used it, um, working with survivors and illness and disease and post-op. So it's basically secrets to healing. It's an invitation to healing the roots to chronic illness and disease. So I have nine case studies in there. I share more of my overall story of growing up with domestic violence to losing my, so it kind of shows you like a, a pattern that we just don't get resolved. Like, right. how did I meet my ex-husband? Like, shouldn't I have known the red flags? Well, maybe I normalized mm -hmm. it. I don't know. I mean, maybe right. I normalized it because- We all do. I, lo I, lost my, I lost my virginity to an abuser, to, to a rapist at 15, you know, to then thinking that sex was love, mm -hmm. right? And, and then, so I've, I've had to do a lot of unpacking that the more I unpack, the more I go back. Like now we're getting ready to go. I'm going to be leading a pilgrimage to Ireland in May. Oh, nice. And it's all going to be unpacking a lot of the patriarchal conditioning, our inner misogyny, the church indoctrination. So it's going back that way we can reclaim the things stolen from our ancestors by these oppressors. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be working with Queen Maeve and the Morrigan. The Morrigan is actually an interesting um, goddess who's misunderstood and villainized, mm -hmm. kind of like what we see. So, but she's no joke. She's just, she's very much about female sovereignty mm -hmm. and our own personal sovereignty. 
but she's a warmonger because she basically, you know, castrates men and does these weird things, you know, and like, <laughs> you know, so it it just is. So yeah, so the secrets to healing kind of talks about it and it gives practical tools on how to do it. That's good. What about uh, where can we find them? Are they on? They're, so they're both on Amazon. Uh huh. And uh, even if you just go on Amazon and type in my name, Laura Benetsky Joseph, you should be able to find them. The link tree link that should be included uh, associated with this podcast will have links to my podcast. They'll have links to my website. They have links to my social media outlets, both on the healing. Because I have two, I have like two Instagrams, right? So I have like the trauma pages mm -hmm. and I have like the healing spirit pages. So my, uh, so I have all those there, um, you know, including the information for those that if, if coming to Ireland, um, but coming the, the trip to Ireland does require some, you've had to have done some work, I think, because if to do the kind of work we're doing, you may not be ready for. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on where you are in your journey with that, but uh, we do have a couple oh. spots left. Well, you know, you know I, I like to do another podcast with you after this trip. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, we're starting. Yeah, Spirit kind of led me and told me that we needed to do have the group start meeting together on Zoom starting in February, because even when I started working with the more again, the the more I started doing it, and I'm like, oh shit, she's no joke. She's really gonna level up things. You know, for anybody who's had a fish tank, right? When you go to clean the fish tank, the water is all clear, but we start cleaning out the bottom. No matter how much you clean, it still gets a little muddy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing when you're working with the Morgan. She's working up things that may not be in your awareness. And if you don't have certain skill sets, it could be quite triggering, you know? Um, so we're going to be setting because it requires certain containers and mm -hmm. safe spaces and, and things like that. So, yeah, so we're going to be working with her. So hopefully by the time we get to Ireland and on these sacred lands, we're the vortexes are just fantastic to do this kind of healing work. And um, yeah, so I'm kind of moving into with my personal journey, just into the generational traumas, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and understanding that, you know, they did these studies even with um, the Holocaust survivors in, from Germany, why some were more resilient than others. And I really think it has a lot to do with the generational trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's generational trauma in your family, you're more susceptible to having and experiencing trauma that's destabilizing, mm -hmm. you know, versus if there's, you know, if you come from like a not broken home and there's healthy things happening in the home, you have a higher chance of resiliency. So it's, it's kind of fascinating, but then I go, yeah. well, is that true or is that not true? Because I look at the trauma on both. I mean, my, my dad was bullied as a kid you know, in Boston schools because of his parents immigrating from Russia and Ukraine. So they used to call him and bully him as commie, oh. you, you know, and, you know, and they used to do nuclear drills under the desks back mm -hmm. then. And they, they would say it's people of his kind. So, you know, that did that. And with my mother, it was, I, I'm, I'm understanding more now from her mom's standpoint, her mom, I'm not sure when her, 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 relatives immigrated here from Ireland, but her father was extraordinarily abusive. Mm -hmm. And because I was trying to figure out why I had a great relationship with my grandmother. I loved her to pieces. She was always gentle, warm, kind, never abusive, but all three of her children basically hated her <laughs> oh. and said she was extraordinarily abusive. You know, and I used to have to go to my dad. So dad, why is this? Like, what did you see when you were dating my mother? You know, and all these other things, right? And and my mother became kind of abusive towards my dad, but not towards my dad. My dad was abusive, mm -hmm. but it was, I always said my dad was the loaded gun and my mom knew how to pull the trigger. And my mom was emotionally abusive, but my dad was physically abusive. Mm -hmm. So, um. You know, and I always say just because you are a survivor of trauma doesn't justify any abuse that you may do too to mm -hmm. others, to your safe people, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's always trying to understand and unpack all that. And then I go, okay, well, look at my grandmother. She had an abusive father. She, her sister died at the age of 18 in 1933 from an illegal abortion. Mm 
So she was too afraid to come to her Catholic father. So she went and had an illegal abortion because it was safer Mm -hmm. and she died. And my grandmother's brother died during World War, I think World War I. Mm. So, you know, so there's all this, there was a lot of violence, you know, so, but I haven't been able to go past that. So I'm hoping even in my own journey that I can get past like, because I helped in this life. Mm -hmm. I helped transition my grandmother and I helped my mother transition. So we did a lot of through ritual and ceremonial practices and, you know, through reclamation of sacred practices that were stolen by churches and and Mm -hmm. uh, other traditions i had i was able to help free a lot of that but now it's time to go back beyond that because i haven't quite seen past there that's interesting i'm so glad you came on and i'd like to have you come back on i will put your link tree in the podcast notes perfect but don't jump off okay yep Slam the Gavels, a podcast to help the public understand what really goes on in these family courtrooms. I am your host, Marianne Petri, author of Dismantling Family Court Corruption, Why Taking the Kids Was Not Enough, and Cry Out for Justice, Poems of Truth, and Raised by These Wolves, How Family and Federal Courts Are Failing Our Children. Please join us again here with uh, Lord Benetsky, Joseph, and other exciting guests. And you can find me on Spotify, YouTube, Apple iTunes, Anchor FM, iHeartRadio, and other platforms I don't know about. And please feel free to buy me a coffee to keep this podcast going. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you very much for having me.